This is Performance Anxiety on the Pantheon Podcast Network, and I'm your host, Mark. And today's guest makes me feel velvety, and that works on a lot of levels here. Welcome Stan Demeski, drummer for The Feelies. They've released their first ever live album, but there isn't a Feelies song to be found on it. It's all Velvet Underground all the time. But before we get there, Stan talks about his early days, being a product of New Jersey school bands, his early recording history, and how he started playing with the Feelies. He also talks about how the band was dropped by A&M Records in a fax. But after that, he landed a gig playing with the band Luna. He talks about how he met and began playing with Dean Wareham in the band, and after years of being disbanded, how the Feelies reunited. And both Sonic Youth and R.E.M. play a big part in getting that done. All of this resulted in the band's new release on Bar None Records, Some Kind of Love. As stated earlier, it's all live and all Velvet Underground covers. Stan also discusses the time the band played with Lou Reed. So check out Some Kind of Love on Bar None, wherever you listen to new music. Get updates on the Feelies Facebook and Instagram pages. Follow us at Performance ANX on socials. And you can show us support with coffee money at ko-fi.com slash performance anxiety or buy merch at performanceanx.threadless.com. Now prepare for some rock and roll Velvet Underground style with Stan Demeski of the Feelies on Performance Anxiety, part of the Pantheon Podcast Network. I'm sorry, my son was just rolling his uh, extra across the floor upstairs. What, what is the podcast name again? I'm sorry. Hi, this is Stan Zemeski from The Feelies, and you're listening to Performance Anxiety Podcast. I hope you buy and enjoy our new Velvet Underground cover record, Some Kind of Love, on the fabulous Bar None record label. This is... Howard sent me the... Uh, he sent me a, a, several things over the, over the, the years here, but <laughs> the new album by The Feelies is... So interesting, and I, but I want to I want to f- kind of find out how you got to that point. So, what I usually like to do is start from the the very beginning, going back to <laughs> to uh, how you got into music in the first place. And so, you grew up in New Jersey, which uh, everybody in the band is from New Jersey. I grew up in New Jersey as well, and I thought it was such an amazing. Yeah. Like Central Jersey, uh, Branchburg. That's not New Jersey. That's not New Jersey. <laughs> Branchburg area, like uh, Somerset, no, Hunterdon County. That's a different state. It is. It really is. Yeah, I lived there for like thirteen years or so. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, between there and, and Scotch Plains and all, and so I loved growing up in that area. Uh, the the music is amazing. You get you know the the New York influence, the Philadelphia influence. It's just it's you get everything there, and. It, when you were growing up, what was it in New Jersey that really grabbed your attention musically, that, that really got you interested in music in the first place? Well, I grew up, I was born in Jersey City. I didn't live there that long. Okay. I grew up mostly in Lyndhurst, which is right by Giants Stadium. Yep. I actually, we moved out for a couple of years, but we didn't move far. We moved to a town called West Patterson, which is really close to where I live now and not far from where, from Lyndhurst, actually. Okay. Uh, so I was born in 1960. I had an older brother and sister. My brother was six years older. My sister was five years older. And back then in the 60s and through a good amount of the 70s, you had really good AM radio. It was all, I mean, the top 40 was like, you know, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and a lot of other really neat bands. And uh, then by the time the 70s came around, you started having like WCBS FM, an oldie, really good oldie station. Oh, yeah. I love Basically that station. Played all the stuff from, you know, the 60s. So I, I just heard a lot of that music and I heard my older brother and sister were listening to and, and their friends. Their friends were always trying to like uh, expose me to different music, too. So I was I had a lot of uh, older mentors, so so to speak. And an amazing era of music to listen to, to grow up listening to and to be sure influenced was. by. What was it that started you playing music? And and you're the drummer for the Feelies, so mm-hmm. was drums your first instrument? Uh, yeah, I guess when I was in third grade, they had a school band day, and they had like basically they pulled us over to to the uh, the junior high school, 
and they had like a little concert band performance. And also they had in our classroom, they had a poster with the band, uh, the band instruments you could play. And I, I saw the snare drum and I was just really, I thought it was really neat. You know, it was a nice chrome one. And I, I was just attracted to drums right away. I, w- I wanted to play guitar too, but drums just drew me in more. So it was school band that really first, the, the first exposure to really, you know, to actually playing an instrument gave me the idea of actually pay, playing an instrument. I would say, I love that. All three of my kids were band kids. So I love that. How old were you outside of like school bands? When did you start playing in your own bands? Uh, well, I started playing the drums. I guess I got a snare drum for Christmas of 69 I didn't really learn how to play for like about a year until one of my brother's friends was selling his drum set. I got that and I didn't really learn for a little while yet. I guess like the first song, I first couple songs I learned how to play were, you know, not very well. I could just, you know, play along to were Brown Sugar, which was current, Let It Be, which was not so current. Okay. So... I'm, I kind of lost track of what your question was. Uh, <laughs> that's fine. I'm, I actually love that. Uh, when did you start playing in your own bands outside of oh, school? Oh, bands. I'm sorry. It, it wasn't too long after that. So I'd say I played. I started playing in school band probably in 70, 72, spring of 72. I joined school band. Then I guess the first actual kind of rock band would be probably around 74 or so. 75 maybe okay when basically i could play drum set and i could play drum set parts and stuff like that it was finding people who could play guitars and basses i was and not to say i was ahead of everybody but i was ahead of everybody (laughs) eventually i found like a guy who could play guitar then another one of my friends was taking up guitar one of my friends who was in school band who played alto saxophone um uh, i convinced him to buy a bass guitar and learn how to play bass. And he always insisted that he was going to do it anyway. But I think I, I pushed him to, to do it a little bit sooner. <laughs> and he went out to a bank called winter hours later on. Okay. Okay. Yeah. In the research, I've, I've became a little bit familiar with, with them. When did you, did you start gigging? I, I hear a lot of, especially in that time frame, that a lot of, a lot of guys are like, Oh yeah, I started gigging when I was like 13 or 14. And I had to have my parents drive me to the, to a bar. Uh, well, we played like, I guess we played like a couple. I started playing in bars and school dances, mostly in cover bands, probably when I was 16. Okay. I, I guess like the drinking age was probably still 21 at that point. I was going into bars when I was 16 to play. And <laughs> I, I looked really young too. I mean, I was <laughs> tall. Uh, I, I had a baby face up until like, you know, I turned like 40 really. <laughs> so it was around 1977 or so. Where I really, 78, 77 and 78 was when I was really playing in, in cover bands and bars. And it would be like the four or five sets a night thing. Oh, wow. That, that kind of like, especially in, in my senior year of high school, we were doing that. And through the summer, I was doing uh, that summer between uh, senior year and college. I did a lot. And that was, that was around the time when I really realized, you know, I, we got to start playing our own music. I mean, I kind of knew it before then because I... I was aware of the New York punk rock scene and uh, I'd, I'd seen television when I, when I was 16 and that really uh, had a huge impact on me as far as, you know, you oh, didn't wow. have to look like Robert Plant and, you know, you could still write you know, your own music and stuff. Right. Yeah. But it took a while to finally get out there and start doing it. I mean, I, I didn't write music, so it was my friends who had it. I played with who had to come up with their own songs, but then eventually I, I ended up joining the, the feelers. So. The first time you're writing or playing original music, is that with the uh, Phosphines? No, um, it was a band called, at first, it's the band that eventually became Winter Hours. Oh, okay. Uh, We were initially called Autonomy. We put out one god-awful single that I have about (laughs) 500 copies in my days. And then that band... We got rid of the singer. We had, we had two singers. The first singer we kicked out for, you know, stupid reasons. Second singer we kicked out because he was just a pompous twit. <laughs> and then, um, don't tell my head. Oh. And then, um, my lips are sealed. And then, um, we, we got, became the band that really turned into winter hours. We were called Ward 8. And, um, we recorded demos and stuff like that with Rob Norris from the, from the Bongos. And okay. Then I went on my first Feelies tour, and this would have been the summer of 84. 
And in that time, when I came back, by that time I come, came back, it was only like a month, but uh, I had been replaced, which was fine. I, you know, I was kind of, I was mad, but relieved. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> we'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Before you skip over this ad, give me one minute. Like most podcasts, I pick sponsors carefully and I use the products that advertise here. Pure Spectrum CBD is a product that has been really beneficial for me. They have a wide variety of great products that can be used on a daily or as needed basis. I've been using the tincture every day and it's been wonderful for easing anxiety. And I absolutely love the isolate. I use it instead of acetaminophen or ibuprofen and it's worked so well for the relief of aches and pains. They also have soaks, lotions, salves, gummies, and more, plus an entire line for fitness recovery. They even have products for your pets. See everything they offer at PureSpectrumCBD.com. And if you have questions, they're there to help. They helped me when I had no idea where to start. After you fill your cart, use code PERFORMANCEANX for 15% off your purchase. Pure Spectrum CBD, Pure Spectrum CBD, Pure Spectrum CBD. How did you end up hooking up with the Feelies? Because you, you, you appear on the first Feelies album. You're not no, the only drummer on there, but... Uh, I'm, not on, I'm not on Crazy Rhythms. Oh, I thought you were... Uh, okay, I'm sorry There's a that. bonus track. When, when it got reissued by A&M, there was a bonus track of Paint It Black. I played on that. Oh, that's what I'm thinking of. I see a rachel and I want you to paint it black No colors anymore, I want them to be black I see the girls walk by dressed in their summer clothes I have to turn my head until my darkness goes I see a line of I guess basically, I started going to Maxwell's pretty early on. It must have been like 80, maybe... I think it was 1980. It was right before the first time I went to see the Feelies, too. And the first time I went to Maxwell's, it was actually like a, a Feelies offshoot band called the Hoboken Hodads, which was two guys from the uh, Bacos and, and Keith from the Feelies and his brother who had been in the Feelies but wasn't in the Feelies anymore at that point. Okay. Uh, but I'm technically, I'm drummer number four in the Feelies. Dave, the percussionist, was the first drummer. Vinny D'Annunzio was second. Anton was third, right. then then me. Oh wow! Okay, and then at that point they had one album out. Uh, this was yeah, that was I guess that came out in 1980. First time I saw them was September 11th of 1980, and I saw their next three New York shows. I guess they played Irving Plaza right after John Lennon was shot. Then oh, wow. um, in the new year they played. I mean, there used to be tons of clubs in New York back then, and they, and they, and they would all like you know bands would go on at like one a.m. at the earliest. Oh, jeez! And then at a venue called the Rock Lounge. Then Anton, uh, they went to California after that. I think for a brief tour, it was only like a few days. Then Anton was really you know kind of a happening drummer back then, and yeah. was playing a lot of different people, and. Um, I, I don't know if he actually officially quit or not, <laughs> but I was playing in various bands at Maxwell's and Steve Fallon said, Oh, the Feelies are looking for a drummer. And he arranged, put me in touch with Keith Denunzio who called me and I went and auditioned for them. So this was like the summer of 81. We only played like, I think we rehearsed like maybe four or five times and we never played out as the Feelies at that point. Okay. We stopped for a little while. It was maybe like a couple months, maybe four or five months. Then in the next, pretty early on in the next year, Bill called me and, and asked me if I wanted to continue playing, but it wasn't going to be as the feelies. It became the Willies, what, which is basically like, you know, an instrumental, more exper experimental band. Okay, That's right. Yeah. We, we, would, we would do some feelies music, but more instrumental and kind of like, it was similar to the demos they had worked up for their second stiff album, which never came about. But, uh, uh so it's right around in there time wise. And then I guess Anton had contacted them and wanted to do some playing again. So they got the idea to use all three of us, me, Dave and Anton. 
So when Anton played the main drum set parts and Dave and I played the percussion parts, that that version of the band played, I think, maybe four shows. And that was, mo I think, only in 1983. Oh, wow. And um, I guess... After that, it seemed like Anton wasn't going to do it. They, they seemed to have a lot of uh, friction between them. Yeah. And Glenn and Bill. That's my opinion. They may, they may disagree on that. And then in 84, we went back to... Actually, Brenda started playing with the Tribes, which was an offshoot of the band, uh, the Feelys in mm -hmm. 1983. Sorry, I'm jumping around so much. No, 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 I, because I actually like, I have a lot um, of questions about this kind of stuff. Yeah, it, uh, it does cover a lot of what you're probably at, wondering. <laughs> I'm asking. So Brenda was playing with the Tribes, and then she started playing with the Willies, because that band kept evolving as far as the instrumentation and who played. Although it was the core of me, Dave, Bill, and Glenn. And then I guess we decided to do do a tour in the summer of 84, and that was, I guess we played our first show. We played a Willie show at Princeton in the spring of 84, which we were called the Willies, but we were basically playing the Feely stuff <laughs> and some of the new music that was uh, eventually ended up on The Good Earth, the second record. summer of 84 as the feelies for about a month in the united states and there was no turning back from there <laughs> obviously not because you've been a part of like every it seems like every feelies offshoot so obviously the feelies uh, the willies young woo speed the plow the tripes and so that's all from this hailed and core group of guys isn't it uh sort of i'm the only one who actually lives in Halden, and i'm not from Halden. <laughs> <laughs> I met my brother-in-law. He was friends. He was my brother-in-law's sister-in-law are the two main people from the tribes and speed the plow. Okay. Um, I met my brother-in-law and in my, 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 well, they, my future brother-in-law's sister-in-law pretty early on when I started playing with Bill Glenn and Dave and Keith. And, um, then uh, they had the tribes at that point. Then eventually Dave joined the tribes and he became a little bit unreliable. And eventually they kind of, told me oh you're gonna play with us now so i didn't have a choice <laughs> and then I ended up meeting my wife through my brother-in-law and sister-in-law my oh. future wife oh that's awesome and she's lived in hell she's lived on the same street her entire life so far wow that's where i'm sitting in my living room now and you can see our halloween decorations today so i see that i got that still that jack-o-lantern in the background <laughs> so this whole time so you, you're putting out albums with the feelies uh, Young Woo, you know, put out an album in 87. Um, let see, Speed the Plow in 91. What what caused the end of, of all of that? Because in, in 92, you start, well, the, you're on the the uh, first Luna release there, uh, Luna Park. I'm on the first three Luna records. Right, right. So how, how did you meet up with Dean and, and guys in, in Luna and move on from uh, the Feelies and that whole group of musicians to Luna? Well, the Feelies had put out two records on A&M, and the first one I thought did real well. The second one, it was a real changing time for A&M and, and for major labels in the record business in, in general, I think. And unless that fourth record had been a big hit, it, it was pretty obvious we, we weren't going to continue. It was just uh, uh -huh. it was a little too much to just go out and tour a real lot without... Uh, you know, we didn't sell a lot of records, you know, if we would have sold a lot of records without really trying too hard, maybe it would have been different. <laughs> right. Um, anyway, um, one band member basically moved out of state and that was in, we played our last shows around July of July 4th of 1991. I kind of hung around looking for something to do for a couple months. And then, uh, I guess in December of 91, Dean gave me a call. And actually, Steve Fallon was the one who got me that as well. So he uh, has had uh, a lot to do in my uh, so-called musical career. 
And, I, and actually, I was in the Phosphines too, which was with his future brother-in-law. So oh, okay. I wasn't the original drummer for the Phosphines, but the Phosphines were kind of based in Lyndhurst, which where which was where Winter Hours was from too. There was a lot of music down in Lyndhurst as well. And anyway, um, I wasn't going to join Luna. I was just going to play on some of the songs on the on the first record. Mm-hmm. And then I guess the drummer they had, who was actually a band member, became more a bit more and more undependable. And um, then it was official that the Feelies had gotten dropped from A&M. They faxed us our, our release, actually. Oh, wow. I know we were dropped. And, you know, it's typical major label stuff. Yeah. And um, as impersonal as you can get. I just kept on playing with Luna, basically, because, you know, I, I was getting I wasn't getting paid a lot of money, but I was getting paid money. So to play drums. Yeah, uh, it was. I needed to keep, you know, keep an income going, and uh, it enabled me to do so for four, about four and a half years. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. I'm looking at the uh, the your Discogs page right now, and I've the Bewitched album. I mean, I just remember seeing that everywhere. decent amount of promotion and stuff but um you know there was a lot of backlash i think from dean breaking up Gal- uh, as, ch- as as children <laughs> as people perceive the <laughs> bro- galaxy 500 which I, I guess he did leave the band yeah and, and there was a lot of resentment about that i felt you know and had nothing to do with me right um especially in england it was real bad in england oh really the, the english the british press really seemed to really they, they really didn't like our first record and oh, basically wow. blamed it on Dean. And it was, it was really, uh, you know, the Brits are like British music press is pretty bad. Right. Yeah. The and, British press in general, from what I understand. But, um, <laughs> yeah, we played for four and a half years and again, we didn't sell a whole lot of records. So then towards the end of that, they wanted me to, uh, you know, I was an employee of the band. Yeah, I was never really a band member, although, you know, I kind of was, but I never really wanted to be, you know, like, I, I mean, Dean was the only one who was so, uh, signed to the record label, as far as I know. I certainly wasn't. Oh, okay. And um, they started wanting to do tours and stuff where I wasn't going to get paid except for per diems, and I refused, and then oh. I got shown the door at that point. Wow, yeah. In, I, in 1996, you... summer of 1996. Jeez. And after that, I... Worked for two years part time at a local farmer's market, and then I got a job where I work now. I've been there 26 years. Oh, wow. Oh, that's awesome. That... Eh, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you a I've been at work. I've been at mine for 13, and so I, I, yeah. I kind of understand what you mean by kind of. I guess the, the question I have really about Luna is did you know Dean before you started playing with him? There was talk of them, of Galaxy 500. 500 opening one of our fourth album tours oh wow and i thought we decided against them but dean always said no we chose to open for the cocktail twins instead um <laughs> i don't know why we would have chosen against them but we yeah. went with uh, another band from, that had it was a two-piece instead of a three-piece and they were quite good to check us all my puppies i'm sure i would have enjoyed galaxy 500 as well but that just didn't work out so i didn't know any of those guys before i started playing with them when dean called me i, I was basically i, I was basically going to tell him you know no thank you but he said the magic words of we'll pay you so. yeah <laughs> It's amazing what those words will do. Uh, it, it did work. I mean, he was always very nice and everything. So it's not like uh, I'm sure if I knew him beforehand, I, I would have been friends with him to start with. So after Luna, you said you know you you started working and all, but you still appeared. You, you're still playing because um, I have I not a that, lot, not a lot. But I see that you you appeared on albums by Ivy, Bob Perry, a, a Winter Out. Ivy done. Ivy was done right at the end of Luna. Ah, okay. Um, and probably in May of '96.
Hours too, and for, was in he was in the, the last version of Ward Eight, and then he was in Winter Hours. Okay, and he's actually the first guitar player I ever played with. Um, it's oh, uh, wow. an eighth grade stage band. Um, <laughs> Nice. So that was done right when I was still in Luna too, because Justin played on some of it. But it was really right at the end. Okay. So, and during those years, I mean, I played a little bit with Speed the Plow, renamed itself as Sunburst, and we just a little bit of playing, not very much at all though. Okay. And every now and then, like Young Will would play, like if Yo Latango asked us to play the uh, Hanukkah show or something like that. Yeah. But in general, I, I I barely played for about seventeen years. Oh wow. Uh, okay. I would play the drums a little bit. Mostly, I played guitar, just sitting around, fooling around. But um, unless I have like a project to work on, I find it hard to really. Uh, sit down and practice for the drums for a couple hours at this point or well, through those years. Well, yeah, I mean, you had a family. Years, I was kind of like, you know, why bother? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you also had other priorities, you know, family yeah. and a job and stuff. So, I mean, it's understandable. Yeah. Going to work takes a lot out of you. And it at home does. that night, it's kind of hard to go down and play for two hours, but that's what I do now. Exactly. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. So, the, so you're interrupting me, actually. I apologize. <laughs> uh, we'll wrap this up. <laughs> so, I'm going to go down after we play. So, uh, after we get this, so don't worry. Oh, okay, good, good. All right. I don't want to take time away from practice. So, what brought the feelies back together? Because I, I heard that I, I believe it was it had something to do with Sonic Youth. Was, was that the I impetus to bring it back together? Really, uh, I think that's you know the easy answer. It just they offered they wanted us to open a show from the Method Battery Park on the Fourth of July, but I think it was just. I think it had kind of been coming about the talk between Bill and Glenn, and that may have been the event that really actually made us follow through and do it. But it seemed like it was going to happen one way or the other. Oh. After a while. Okay, but Sonic Youth is a good impetus. To, it's a, it's a good, you know. Hey, you know, what Sonic Youth wants us to do, let's let's go ahead and do it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think that you know. But, that I guess Steve had Steve Allen had wanted us to, to do it. It was really up to Bill and Glenn. It's their band, you know. Um, and when they were, I, th I think when Bill was ready to start playing again is really, in my opinion, is is why we started playing again. One of the other things, kind of along the same lines as Sonic Youth wanting you guys to to open a show, you also played in the music of REM in '09 at the request of REM. I mean, so that's amazing to me. I guess so. We opened. Uh, we we did play. That is, right. <laughs> we played one song at Carnegie Hall. <laughs> I guess it was at their request. I'm not really sure, but we did do a, one of the Good Earth tours was opening for them on for. I think two and a half weeks or three weeks on the pageantry tour. Oh, wow. So they, they, they've always been very supportive. They were always really nice people. They deserve the su success they've achieved. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so this kind of, you know, the, the Sonic Youth uh, playing the REMs, is that what got the band to play more often and, and actually start thinking about putting out a new album? Because a couple of years after the REM show, you guys released uh, Here Before. Is it too late to do it again, or should we wait another ten? I think that was in 2011, I believe. Uh, I forget what year it was, but yeah, after we got back together, we got back together in 2008, I think. Yeah. And then it was a couple of years, and then we did that the fourth record no fifth record sorry yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we did, did another record after that yeah in between yeah so, yeah so were you guys when you started getting back together and, and playing in 08 and 09 was it to play live shows or was the idea to make a new album forming at I, that time i, I don't think there you know there doesn't seem to be really much of a game plan it's just sort of <laughs> what, what happens and it's always been like that. That's, that's, that's part of the reason why the band hasn't had more commercial success. And I, I think both of those, both Glenn and Bill really weren't trying to get commercial success. They were just playing music that they enjoyed and, you know, having a good, good time doing it. There's not a lot of, not a lot of a game plan. <laughs> well, it, it, you know, it's, 
kind of worked. I mean, you guys are, uh, you have enormously influential fans, like, like I said, Sonic Youth, R.E.M. And- uh, I don't really see it, but okay. <laughs> uh, you know, we're a cult band, you know, we make music for other musicians oh. and critics. Up until this point, the band has never released a live album. That's so true. The new album that's coming out is... It's out. It's out. Okay. It's, it, but it, it is... It's out on the 13th. It is a live album, but it's not mm-hmm. of Feely's music. It's in a very extensive retrospective of Velvet Underground. Yeah, the band had always covered Velvet Underground songs, you know, from before my time in the band. And... uh it's sort of a bunch that we've covered in the past or the band has covered in the past with some ones that the band has never covered. Like uh, the band never did sweet Jane or Oh, Oh sweet. Nothing. Yeah, we do. Oh, sweet. We do. Oh, sweet. Nothing on here. Yes. It- did all tomorrow's parties oh that's um, one of my favorites yeah that's that's a re- in my opinion it's a really good version yeah and uh the head, head held high we did heard her call my name they did in the the cbgb's vinnie band days <laughs> um sunday morning we've played on and off glenn actually recorded i think i recorded that on one of his solo records with him or it may even be, been an outtake i can't remember to tell you the truth and uh, I can't remember the twenty. I just happen to have I happen to have the record right over here. See, see, I got the Ivy record next to it too. <laughs> John Coltrane. Oh, sweet! Oh man, Plus I got me the John Coltrane record for my birthday. Oh, nice. Let's see. Uh, Who loves the sun? We we've done more in more recent years as as well as there she goes again. What goes on? We recorded on what go, uh, on only life. Okay. Head held high. We used to do like in, in the like 86 or so, not for long. Waiting for the man is a recent one that we started doing. That one's that's so good. because I couldn't hear where it was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it kind of works anyway. Uh, White Light, White Heat, we recorded as a bonus track for the fourth record. Uh, as wow. I said, I heard her call my name. They used to do in the old, day, old days. Uh, New Age, we never did before. That was the other song I was thinking of. Oh, okay. That's the story of my life we never did. All Tomorrow's Parties is newer. Rock and Roll, we've done since we gotten back together. I can't remember when we started, maybe halfway through it. Okay. We're going to have a real good time together. We used to do that in the old days. We used to do a medley of Run, 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 European Sun, and What Goes On on here, which just Run, Run, Run. I can't stand it. We didn't do back then, but we've, we've done it in more recent years. After Hours, we did um, started doing that for the final show at Maxwell's. Oh, wow. Okay. And Oh, Sweet Nothing, uh, like as I mentioned, we only started doing recently. Actually, we've only did it for this this record. Oh, wow. Okay. So when uh, you guys put th- this together, was the intent to release it as a live album or was it just the, was the intent originally to just do the show? I think it was because they were having that Velvet Underground exhibit in New York. But, you know, I don't always get told all this stuff. <laughs> I, you know, I, people deal directly with Glenn and Bill and they don't yeah. always, you know keep me in touch of what's going on and if, if it's something really important of course they will but you know i think it was spurred on by that 
that's what I've been told. But then, you know, also it's like, we got to come up with things to do to keep things fresh. And this was, even though it's all doing somebody else's old songs, it's, it was something different. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it's, a band that's highly influential to to you. They, I mean, were, they were influential. That I'll give you. Yeah. Was there a general agreement on the set list? I mean, was it pretty easy to come up with? Because there's 18 tracks on this album. So, you know, it's a good bunch of songs. A lot of it is what Bill and Glenn want to play. Ah, okay. uh, you know, um, um, like the loaded tracks, I think Glenn like suggested those. I mean, he, he's got to sing them. So, you know, yeah. You know, I always defer to that aspect of things. You know, I mean, I can play drums on a lot of different things, but, you know, who's singing it, you know, has, has got to be able to sing the song, feel comfortable with the range and, and the lyrics. Yeah, very true. Very true. So is there plans to do this kind of thing again with the, an entire Velvet Underground? Uh, I don't set? think we'll do the whole uh, the whole night. Like, well, actually, this wasn't even the whole night. This was the first set. We usually do two sets when we play nowadays. It's an evening with the feelies, you know, a decent amount of material that we can play. And we kind of like to play for a long time. And it's not easy for us to get together to play because not everyone lives around here. So when we do... Uh, I guess we like to get the make the most of it. Yeah, know? yeah. But I don't think we're. I don't know. I, we'll we'll be playing some of these songs, but I don't think we'll be doing like a whole set of it unless they change their minds. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's hey, you know, like you said, it's it's their band. They that's they do what they yeah. want to do. So there was two sets for on this night. Was the second set more Velvet Underground or was it more Feelies? No, the second set was a Feely set. Oh, it was okay. pretty much like our arena rock set, oh, our festival cool. set. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. That's what we call it now nowadays. Our festival set. Yeah. <laughs> well, we can't play that. <laughs> So, what was your favorite track to play uh, of the Velvet Underground stuff that has come out? Uh, it, it was it was nice playing. Uh, it was great playing Sweet Jane because I mean, I the first band I played in, we played Sweet Jane. Basically, you know, like a, a sort of a mutated version of the rock and roll animal version. So playing playing this was really nice. And we actually played Sweet Jane with Lou one time at a at a club in uh in, on Long Island. Oh, right wow. after um Only Life had come out. Actually, the tracks are on a bootleg. It's on this. I don't know. Oh no, <laughs> the stuff is on. It's on um. It's on the internet. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's, if you I, did, I could also I could also email you the tracks if you if you'd like to hear them. Oh, definitely. I would add this is from my tape. Oh wow! A friend of mine used to have a record store in New York, and I, I loaned him the tape, and I said, "Don't put it out." And he was like, "No, no." And like six months later, he's like, "Oh, I didn't put it out. Someone else did." I'm like, oh, "It's from my tape, buddy." Oh wow. <laughs> And it was the guy from Winter Hours. Oh. <laughs> See, it all leads back to Winter Hours. <laughs> well, yeah, I would definitely love to hear that. I'll, I'll reach out to you and, and shoot you my email. That would be amazing. So, so the album is just, it was a, so cool to listen to. I mean, it's, it's so well done. It's, it's called Some Kind of Love. Where is it coming out? I mean, how can people find the album and, and pick it up? And Well, it came out on Bar None, which is... I feel very lucky to have like my record executives were started out with Steve Fallon then moved on to Herb Albert and Jerry Moss and then moved on to uh, Bob Krasnow. And now I'm now with Glenn Morrow, who I've known Glenn Morrow probably since like he actually auditioned for an early cover band that probably like in 78 that I was in that eventually became Winter Hours. Oh, wow. It's a long story. It's a long path. <laughs> 
he didn't make the audition because he couldn't sing like Elvis Costello and Led Zeppelin because we were still in the bad things. <laughs> but I've kind of known him that long. Wow. Um, he didn't remember it at all, but it was through a mutual friend. So it's uh, it's available through Bar None. You can go on their website and get it. I mean, it's in stores if, if you have an actual record store by you. Yeah. Not everyone does. Unfortunately. I, I think you can download it too, but it seems like there were problems with that. I'm not really sure. Oh, wow. I prefer, you know, if I'm home, I prefer to listen to, to vinyl. I hate to say vinyl. I prefer records. Right. I mean, I like CDs too. I don't, I don't get the whole cassette thing, you know, why people have to thing for cassettes because they're not that, they don't sound that good. No, I don't understand that either. My son loves it. I don't get it. I yeah. was thrilled when, they, when the, we went from cassettes to CDs. So it's, yeah, that was that was a good thing. I mean, CDs a lot of them just don't weren't done that well because they were rushed. But uh, yeah. in general, I, I I like records. Yeah, oh yeah, I get scared of records because I'm a, I'm so afraid I'm going to scratch them because I don't have a great turntable. I have a decent one, but not a great one. I'm and I'm just I don't know. Maybe maybe I just scratched way too many as a kid. That and I, it's just a, a <laughs> fear I've yeah. gotten. Turntable, so and I have really good speakers. So oh, that's. Well, what's the, the best way to follow the feelies and, and see what you guys are up to? Is it uh, social media accounts that are... Uh, there's a Facebook page, and I I put up an Instagram page recently. We have an, a Twitter page, but there's not a whole lot going on there because of what it's become. Yeah. I... Whatever changes, maybe we'll pick it up again. That's basically the Facebook page is really where it has the most up-to-date stuff. Oh, awesome. And I try to share it onto the Instagram page. Okay, perfect. This has been awesome. I've so enjoyed listening to the the, the live album, and it's it's been Thanks. playing constantly. It's uh, <laughs> it, it works out perfectly f uh, for my my commute. I get to hear almost the entire thing on my commute, so it, it's been a pleasure listening to it. And it's been awesome talking to you and, and learning more about behind the scenes of the feelies and the, and the, <laughs> the new album. Thank you.